World War II was over. Americans looked forward to peace and prosperity. In the U.S. Navy, demobilization orders sent thousands of ships into mothballs as the sailors went home. In airship squadrons, it was all about who could be fastest to deflate, crate, and be first out the gate. A group of Brazilian crews have been sent to Lakers for training, but their country canceled a prospective blimp program. Hollywood had made only one blimp movie. Actual combat records remain classified. Summaries held that, during the war, blimps had not sunk or even heavily damaged a single submarine. It seemed the blimps, hastily put into production for the war emergency, had little future amid emerging guided missile technology brought in from Germany. Gigantic examples of wartime construction, some LTA bases were sold off, their massive timber hangars never to hold an airship again. Hitchcock, Texas, went on the auction block. At Homa, Louisiana, the unique wooden doors opened one last time to be dynamited. Even worse, in September 1945, down at NES Richmond, Florida, a hurricane with winds topping 160 miles an hour blew apart and burned three giant wooden hangars, destroying 25 airships and hundreds of stored airplanes and automobiles. The Navy's biggest airship squadron, ZP-21, was devastated, and the largest timber structure complex in the world was wiped out. Incredibly, only one man was killed, the station's fire chief. By 1946, airships were sold surplus for a few thousand dollars each. Goodyear ships borrowed during the war were returned, while other entrepreneurs bought blimps and turned them into flying billboards. Douglas Lay, a legend in advertising, had a number of former Navy airships carrying signs all over the country. Blimp crews found employment flying for Lay and citizens far inland got their first glimpse of coastal patrol airships. The former L-19 was destined for Europe, but on arrival there was no hangar and no helium, so the airship was inflated with hydrogen and rigged under open sky. As the Underberg, she had more than 10 successful years flying with hydrogen. Goodyear had delivered four of the modern and capable M-type blimps. The three operational ships had served in Florida and then California. XM-1 established a new endurance record of 170 and one-third hours in October 1946, beating the Soviets' record. M-ships also provided excellent platforms for testing sensors. On one mission, a surface ship's towed sonar was flown for at-sea tests. Later on, the M-ship was used to perfect airborne variable death towed sonar. Commander Carl Seiberlich received the Harman Trophy for this work. When a plane load of dignitaries went missing in Canadian wilderness, XM-1 flew into Manitoba. K-ships, many wartime rescues of stranded airplane pilots and shipwrecked sailors seemed to offer employment in the peacetime Navy. The Navy standardized K-ships rescue equipment and techniques. As demonstrated at air shows and in training, the rescue mission would begin by locating the victim. Crews tossed a special ballast bag over the side holding the airship into the wind. The sea ballast bag filled up and kept the airship at a consistent altitude. The pilot had the tricky job of keeping the airship on station during the rescue. Using the pulley rig over the aft door, a life ring harness was lowered to the victim. Sandbags passed out through lifted deck plates and open bomb bay 
served like an elevator's counterweights. An able-bodied victim could put himself in the harness and be easily hauled aboard. If the victim required assistance, a raft and a crewman would be lowered to help the injured man into the raft and then the rescue ring. Either way, the blimp crew then hauled the lines hand over hand until the victim was safely inside. Finally, the rescue crewman and the raft were hauled back in. The weight of the discarded sandbags helped compensate for those rescued. The sea bag was then triggered to trip up to empty and recovered for the next use. The survivors were comforted with blankets and hot coffee during the ride home. The K-120 was the first of what was supposed to be a group of specially modified rescued airships. K-120 operated from the Banana River Naval Air Station. Since local search and rescue was a Coast Guard mission, there was effort to make the airships part of the Coast Guard. Goodyear entertained personnel from the Cleveland Coast Guard Station. A few airship rescue crews were even trained in airships before the idea was abandoned. In spite of all its success stories, rescue by buoyant aircraft would later disappear. Airships were eventually squeezed out of the rescue business by faster, simpler helicopters in spite of less endurance and capacity. The national disarmament continued until on July 1, 1946, only 16 active airships were authorized. From a wartime strength of 120, this was the smallest number of buoyant vehicles in American service since 1942. The War Department became the Defense Department as the National Security Act of 1947 created the U.S. Air Force. James Forrestal became Secretary of Defense. Lighter than air squadrons on the East Coast were merged into a single new unit, ZP-2. Training and other operations on the West Coast were consolidated at Santa Ana, California into new squadron ZP-1. Yet in August 1947, Navy brass decided not to support airships with an overhaul and repair center on the West Coast. Three M-type and seven K-type airships were ferried across the United States. ZP-1 set up East Coast operations at Naval Air Facility Weeksville, North Carolina. Wartime K-ships had a good safety record, but when accident or electromechanical problems sped gasoline fire, even 400,000 cubic feet of helium could not stop deadly fires. Fighting off obsolescence, K-ships from around the fleet had been fitted with different varieties of sensor and weapon mounting. A new effort to standardize the remaining airships created the ZP-2K series. The K-Type, whose roots went back to the mid-1930s, was to be extensively upgraded with reversible propellers, improved sensing equipment, more modern electronic equipment, and in-flight fuel connection, and auxiliary power unit to power it at all, and a larger helium envelope to lift it all. Reversible propellers improved ground handling. No longer would a squadron of men be required to slow down the blimp just to mast it and dock it. Extended missions at sea were made practical as aircraft carrier operations were practiced and perfected. 
Although first tested early in 1944, the team of anti-submarine airship and ASW carrier was finally being perfected after the war. Landing on the pitching flight deck of a small escort carrier in choppy seas and gusty winds was tricky since both ships tended to move independently in their own medium. Many a ZP-2K's landing gear was bashed and had to be replaced, following rough landings during at-sea operations. Once the airship was on deck, yaw lines were run through flight deck edge cleats to hold the blimp fast. The airship could be refueled, rearmed, expendable sauna boys replaced, and crews could be exchanged in the minimum time possible. Lifting off, the crew carefully avoided the carrier's island and returned to anti-submarine station. Long-duration ASW patrols protecting the fleet were the order of the day. Exercises with large carriers including the Midway class USS Coral Sea and Franklin Roosevelt CVAs, were completed successfully. It was found that the small escort carrier, or CVE, was completely adequate for supporting an entire group of airships. Experiments with improved weaponry were carried out while air crews trained with proven anti-submarine techniques that arrived very late in World War II. Research and development test flights continued. Elevators on the bow, like the submarine's diving planes, were tested on the K-10 and other ships. For study of envelope sag and loading, cameras atop Hangar 1 recorded wrinkles as envelope pressure was reduced. Like other engineers, Norman Mayer once flew inside K-10's upper fin for research. However, submarines were also undergoing improvements. Germany had deployed the advanced Type 21 electroboats in the final days of World War II. Lessons learned from operating two of these electroboats resulted in American submarines being modified in what was called the Greater Underwater Propulsion Program, or GUPI for short. Training with real submarines virtually non-existent during the war, was provided when U.S. subs participated in joint ASW exercises. Sana boys would be deployed in a wagon wheel pattern to locate the sub. Then magnetic detector gear would be used to pinpoint it. Used to dodging destroyers and airplanes, the submariners grew to loathe operations with airships, which could track them until their last gap of breathable air forced them to give up. A bizarre accident during one exercise caused the ZP-2K-86 to kill both engines, stranding her on the water. Her submarine adversary, the USS Sea Poacher, took great delight in towing the helpless airship back to Key West. Another airship ditched when Aflines snagged the carrier's flight deck and ripped the envelope. ZP-2Ks were eventually flying in the reserves. The Soviet blockade of Berlin further split the former allies. Soviet Russia's intensive submarine building program would become the next challenge for U.S. Navy airships.